around the seats, you can see a book. It is a workbook called Multi-Ethnic Conversations. And hopefully you guys are, all have one. There are a few others floating around. But if you do not have one beside you, look around the uh, sanctuary and pick one up. If I, I, I guarantee that there's are, there are enough today, um, but if we don't have enough um, next week, we, we, we can always add more uh, to the conversation. Now, these books are going to come in handy over the next 10 weeks. Next week, I will start a series by the same title, Multi-Ethnic Conversations, and kind of look around our community, right? Look around our schools, look around uh, uh, the world and see that the world is changing in, in, in a lot of ways. People look different. People are different than us. And, and sometimes, in some ways, we need to minister to, to, to people different than us in different ways. We, we need to think differently. We, we, we need to act differently. And, and so... How do we get on the same page with God and his church and, and to be able to serve these people in our community and be able to, to show them Jesus? Show them the Jesus that changes lives. But also, because a lot of them are Christians too, it's not just about um, introducing them to Christ because there's a lot of different uh, people out there that know Jesus, but help partner with people that are different with us. Uh, to be able to serve the community. So uh, over the next 10 weeks, we're going to basically be joining in on a conversation together and, and, and to be able to learn and grow and, and, and to, to become more like Christ. Um, as you can see on that, it says, building the unity in the church. And, and that's really what, what our goal is, is for, for unity. Um, for, so, so all of us can be one, Right? So, so we're going to be talking more about that starting next week, um, but wanted to let you guys know about that. But ministries are kind of back to normal starting this week, so youth on, on Wednesdays, children, uh, adults group uh, starting this Wednesday. We've got ladies' Bible study, basketball tonight if you're interested. Coming up uh, next month, there's this game of some sort that people like to throw around this uh, big sports ball and, and, and to catch it in, in the end zone and, and score points. Some of you love that uh, game. I, I love football, personally. Um, but, but we try to make it a, a party for, for, for more than people that just love uh, football. They, they might like playing cards or, or euchre specifically. A lot of euchre fans out there, maybe chess. I don't know, whatever game you want to play, you can bring. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, we're going to have a party that night. Bring some appetizers to share, maybe wings or, or, or nacho dip or wh I don't know, whatever, whatever you like, bring it. If you want to bring some sausage pinwheels, that would be great too. Um, those, those were good uh, this morning. Um, and then uh, just put on your calendar, um, April 13th and 14th, we are going to be hosting a conference. So what we learn over the 10 weeks we're going to have a conference here uh, where every one of you guys are invited, but we're going to also invite other churches and their leadership teams and, and whoever they want to bring uh, to, to talk about that same conversation. And I have some amazing speakers lined up for you guys. You're not going to have to hear from me that weekend. It's, it's great. <laughs> you guys are going to get a break from me. Uh, but we're, we're, we're going to have a, a professor, um, a vice Executive Vice President of Wesley Seminary, um, um, Yamil Asiavendo, I think I said his name right. Um, uh, we're going to have Santis Beatty, uh, a youth pastor slash multi-ethnic uh, change uh, uh, person from North Carolina coming up here. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Meg Pueo and her husband Fabi, who uh, actually... Um, uh, uh, girl from here uh, that went, went down to Columbia, married her husband, and they moved back here, and, and they uh, work in the marketplace here. And then also uh, Zach, who leads Immigrant Connection, the, the, the national body of that. So it's really going to be some, some good quality stuff. And 
Uh, we'll, we'll have some more about uh, that uh, coming out uh, in the next few weeks, um, but it's going to be a great way to be able to serve not only um, us and learn and grow together, but also for us to be able to serve the church together. Uh, so so that, that'll be a great and exciting thing. Uh, today we're going to be in Luke 4, 1 through 13. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. At the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it'll all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard your, you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord, your God, to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. It's all about you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So when I was a youth pastor in New York, we had this ministry called 30-Hour Famine. Have any of you guys ever participated in 30-Hour Famine? Have any of you volunteered to not eat for 30 hours? And then, not only that, we joined it up, and, and, and a lot of youth groups do this, but, but, but they combine it with an all-nighter. So not only do you have, you know, for us it was like 50 hungry teens, you have 50 exhausted teams, teens. Exhausted and hungry is a horrible combination. <laughs> you kind of almost get to the place of hangry. You know, the Snickers commercial, hangry. You get hangry, so you need a Snickers or, or whatever it might be. But when you are hungry and tired, you can sometimes do some stupid stuff. Things that you regret. Things that you would have never done if you weren't hungry or exhausted. Now, you get low blood sugar, you... You, you're not thinking clearly, and sometimes you get yourself in trouble. I, I think I probably made a lot of poor decisions because I was tired or hungry or, or, or both. I think in the new year, we are going to be tired and hungry a lot. It's just really a lot of part, part of our lives. Sometimes we will face temptations. And I think some temptations will be ones that we have faced for years. And sometimes it'll be easy to say no, or, or sometimes it'll be hard to, to, to say yes. So, sometimes our, our temptations will be new, and, and it'll surprise us. It'll take us off guard and be like, wait, I've never been tempted by that before. Why, why do I feel this way? Why, why do I want that so much? Some temptations shouldn't be as hard as we make them. Some, some temptations should be easy to walk away, but some of them won't be. Some of those temptations will not be easy to walk away. And I think this passage has, has a lot to show us. First off, the humanity of Jesus, that Jesus was tempted to sin. He was tempted. Now, he obviously did not. But how did he address that? How, how, how did he approach that? How, how, how did he defeat temptation even though he was exhausted, even though he was hungry, low blood sugar, whatever it might be? How was he able to defeat temptation? And I think the answer is really told uh, right, right off, off, 
from the beginning. Verse 1, it says, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. Now, he's 100% God. He, he, he's also 100% human, so he is like us. But he's also full of the Holy Spirit. And each and every one of us can also be full of the Holy Spirit and make the same decisions that Jesus made. It's interesting, right? But so many of us fall short. So many of us make different decisions than, than what Jesus had, had made. But it is possible in our humanity and in Jesus' humanity to just be what him, be like him. Because Jesus was painting a picture for us in his humanity. He's like, you can actually be like us. Like, he, what he would say is, be holy as I am holy, right? Like, he wouldn't say that if we couldn't be like him. But there's something about it, to, to, to be set apart, to, to, to be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, we, we, we see why he was full of the Holy Spirit, right? It says he returned from Jer uh, Jordan, right? What happened in Jordan? He was baptized. He was just baptized before he entered into the desert. So you have this water scenario, right? He was just immersed in all this water, right? He had all that he could have. He had plenty of it. But when he went to the desert, there's no water. It's empty. There, 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 there's nothing around. He didn't have it. And so... He had plenty of it, and then he had none of it, right? So he here was, was, was with God. He was with John the Baptist, and, and, and he's experiencing this new thing, this thing that he had never really experienced as, as a person on, on, on this earth before. But it said it was, he was also led by the Spirit into the desert, so the Holy Spirit was taking him there. And it says, over the next 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. During that time, he ate nothing. And at the tent end, he was obviously hungry, just like any of us would be, right? 40 days. I, I, I've had friends that have done fast for 40 days. And notice I say I have for, had friends. I have not been one of those people. Maybe I should. Maybe, maybe someday I, I, I should do a 40-day fast. And maybe we can do it one together. But I think I had struggled with that, right? But, but the Holy Spirit led him to do that. And so he did it. And he did it as an example for us to, to, to also uh, follow. But Jesus, during this time, experienced three temptations in the desert. And, and I, I think we probably look at it sometimes, well, he was hungry, that temptation, right? But I'm, I'm going to look at this temptation a little bit differently today. So, so the first temptation is this temptation of identity. This temptation of identity. Who am I? A lot of us ask our, those questions, who am I? And, and, and Satan questioned who Jesus was, right? It says, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Now, now Jesus knows who he is. But there's this temptation, this, this struggle that sa Satan is good with, right? He, he's trying to confuse, right? Because 40 days without food, if you're going to be easily confused, this is going to be the easiest time to confuse someone. But he says, if you are the son of God, because, right, Satan is good at lying, twisting words, changing things. And he, it's the same thing that he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. Right In the garden, Satan asked, did God really say not to eat the fruit in the garden? No, no, God did not say that. He said to eat, not eat from this tree, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat this one. Satan was good at questioning the word of God to make you think differently. And he was doing the same thing with Jesus here. Because just 40 days earlier, at the baptism, what did God say when he got baptized? This is my son, whom I love, who am I well pleased. He showed him his identity. 
He knew his identity. He knew who he was. He knew who his father was. And there was something more powerful than that. Uh, Just amazing, right? He knew who he was. And, and, And knowing our identity should be enough. It should be enough. But don't we all question our identity from time to time? Are we tempted to minimize God's word so we we can justify falling into temptation? But God's word, if we spend time in it, we actually find out our own identity. We find out that we also are children of God, that we are ambassadors in Christ, that, 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 that we are his workmanship, that he knew us more than anybody else, that, that he knows the hairs on our head, that, that he knows each and every one of us as, as we were being formed in our mother's womb, right? Like, that's a big deal. He knows each and every one of us, and he knows our identity. And so many times we, we push that aside, that, oh, well, may, maybe I'm not a child of God. Maybe... He doesn't love me. Maybe, maybe, maybe I really wasn't made in the image of God. And we push it aside. And I think this is one of the, 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 the biggest temptations for a lot of people, that we just push it aside. But Satan continues on, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. How does Jesus reply? It is written. It is written. He, he, he starts with saying something that he never actually specifically said himself. He says something from the word of God. Here Jesus is quoting scripture. He he responds with the word of God to to Satan questioning the word of God, right? Deuteronomy 8.3, this is how he responds. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Can you imagine saying this after not having eaten eaten anything for, for 40 days? I'm sure he would have loved some bread. I w- I'm sure he would have loved to have turned that, that stone into bread. And guess what? He has the power to do it. He can do it. That's not the thing that, that, that uh, Satan is really try- trying to make him do. It's really trying, trying to make him second guess who he is. But the enemy wants you to second guess your identity. And, and he wants to keep you out of Scripture because Scripture affirms our identity. And the more we are in Scripture and praying, prayer connecting with, with our Father, we will know our identity. So we have this temptation of identity, asking who we are. We also have a temptation of priority, asking who is God. Who is God, right? In an instant, it says... Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All these different kingdoms. I will give you all their authority, all their splendor. It has been given to me. I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now, when I read that, I think of a lot of people, because a lot of people think that, that, that Satan has the authority on the earth. Now, it is true that he has some authority. It, do, it is true that he has some authority on the earth. And, and who gave him that authority? God allows him to do some things on the earth, but he limits Satan's authority. There's parameters, there's boundaries. You see, God wants us to choose him. And and. and and he's allowing these things in, in, in our lives to distract us. He's allowing these things to, to, to help us to, to, to make the decision on our own that we are going to follow him. But he doesn't actually allow that Satan to do anything and everything he wants to do. So he, he, he limits Satan's power. And, and Jesus replies, it is written, Right? It is written. He uses words, God's word again to refute what Satan is saying. And I think we need to remember that Satan is the father of lies, that he knows how to distort the truth. And, and, and Jesus continues. It says, he worship, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I have this say, saying that, that, that I do every now and then to, 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 
to, to, to make Jesus first, to make Jesus central, to make Jesus everything. Now, I may have stolen that from someone. I don't know. I, I, I may have heard that somewhere. But the, the, the key is, is that that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? The world does, does not revolve around us. The world should revolve around God. And so many times we, we, we try, try to make the world or, 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 or God revolve around us. And, and, if, and if God or Jesus doesn't do the things that we ask him to, then, 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 then our faith fails. And our faith struggles. Rather than aligning with, with him and his principles and, and obeying him and his word, right? Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What is your priority? What is our priority in life, right? Jesus knows how to fight temptation and it is through his relationship with God and his word. Because what if God was our only priority? What if he was first and, and, and central and everything to us? What, what if we passed on our own desires and our own preferences? What, what if we, we sought the, the kingdom of God before anything else? What if we sought his righteousness? What if, if our heart was always drawn to, to, to Christ first rather than to, to, to our desires? Right? We can say God is our priority, but does our schedule match up with it? We, we, we can say that we are dedicated to God fully. But does our, 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 our credit card statement align with that? We, we, we can say that we do not bow down to Satan, and probably don't, right? Most of us probably don't. We probably don't make man-made idols. I don't see any people uh, forming uh, calves of gold or whatever it might be. I, I don't think that's our problem here. But I think sometimes the, the, the biggest struggle for, for, for Americans is, is not that, 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 that we bow down to Satan or that we make calves of uh, uh, golden calves. I think sometimes it's just that we prioritize self, that we choose what we want to do. We have basically become our own idols. We choose what we want to do, when we want to do it. We, we, we can have something fast and we can have it now. We can order it on Amazon. We can Google it. We can have the answer with a matter of seconds. We prioritize ourselves. We have this, this temptation to answer the question, who is God? And sometimes we want to put ourselves in that seat because it's easy because we like control. So we have this temptation of priority. We have this temptation of identity, and we also have this temptation of authority. Who am I to God? Who am I to God? Can, can, can I twist God's arm to, to, to make him do what I, I want him to do? If, if I jump off this, this temple, will, will, will God send the angels to rescue me before I get injured or whatever it might be? If, if, if I do all these things, will, will God protect me? Am I testing him? You know, I think it's interesting that here, here Satan says, if you are the Son of God again, he says it twice to Jesus. He's questioning his identity again. He doesn't say, though, Jesus is not, he, he is, he is not the Son of God, right? Because I think Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God. But he's trying to still get Jesus to question. He says, if you are. Throw yourself down from here. Command his angels to guard you. Lift up uh, it, them in their hands and, and you will not be hurt, basically. Right? And what does Jesus say? It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I wonder how many times that, that we've put God to the test that, and, and, and sometimes that, that we maybe never heard God's answer or, or, or heard his reply or, or, or he didn't do exactly what we wanted. So we're like, okay, God, we're done with you. We just throw him out the window. So we have three different temptations, this identity of who am I, this priority of who is God and this authority, who am I to God, right? This relationship. And I wonder if, if it's three different temptations or is it really one? 
The temptation of power, this, this temptation of control, right? We all want the power to choose, this power to control what, what we do, this, this identity, this priority, this, this authority in our lives. And I wonder if, if temptation is not necessarily a, a power struggle between, between us and Satan, this, this temptation, but us and God. Let me, let me say that again. Temptation is not necessarily a power struggle between us and Satan, but us and God. You see, Satan was trying to, to get Jesus to think about God differently. To think about himself differently. And I think God shows us this perfect life, right? Just like he did in, in Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Like they had everything. The world was perfect. He gave them everything they needed, and yet they chose the one thing that God said not to do. How often do we do that? Because God has given us freedom. The, the, this free reign on a lot of things. He's given us this freedom. But it really comes down to this trust. Do we trust that God actually knows what is best for us? He's given us everything that we need, but it comes down to trust. And when Eve decided to, to eat of that fruit, it was more about trust. St. Ignatius Define sin as unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. There's a lot of truth to that. And I think God knows what our deepest happiness is. It's that relationship between us and Him. He knows, He puts in this desire in our heart what, what is real. God knows who we are and what is central, what is purpose uh, for him. See, God was not limiting Adam and Eve, but rather protecting them. He was caring for them. Life was perfect. Then they, they stopped and rethought what God had told them. And then they ate of the fruit. The world fell beneath them when they thought something else was a better option when they thought that what God's word was, was said was not all the truth. They, made, they were second-guessed. They, 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 they thought differently of the word of God. And in this new year, we're, we're going to probably have a temptation. We're going to have all kinds of temptations. And, and it may not to, to be to get drunk. It may not be to have an affair. And it may not be to bow down to Satan. All of us are going to have different temptations, but, but probably during the new year, you'll probably be tempted to be content where you're at in your relationship with Christ. You, you might have a temptation to follow your desires rather, rather than God's desires. You may have this temptation to argue about politics. You may have this temptation to gossip. You might have this, this temptation to be comfortable. You might have this temptation to do the easy thing instead of the right thing. Sometimes the hard thing is the right thing. Temptation maybe not to love your neighbor or the temptation to, to not serve your community or temptation to fill in the blank. And there's so many different temptations that, that we struggle with that take us away from God. That, that put us on the sideline of maybe it's uh, identity or, or authority or priority to, to, to help us to, to, to get distracted and to, to think about anything else other than God, right? To, to, to not follow him, to, to, to do our own thing, to, to follow our own desires. And, and I think Jesus has this, this perfect description of, of what, we, what he wants us to do. He wants us to respond with the Word of God. But the thing is, if we don't know, if we don't know the Word of God, how can we ever respond with the Word of God? You know, if, you are, if our temptation is an identity, how, how do we know that we are a child of God? 
How do we know that we are ambassadors for Christ? How, how do we know that, that we are a city on a hill, that we are the salt and light? How, how, how are, we, are we to know that God wants to use us and gives us a purpose, that we are supposed to serve the world and not serve ourselves? If we don't look in the Word of God, then how can we, can, can we know that, that, that Jesus takes priority? That Jesus is the full authority. That we come to him and then we are given salvation. That we can hold on to that basic truth. I would ask the worship team to come forward. And as they do, I want you to think about three things. And I think we're going to take a little bit more deeper walk into this next week. But think about Jesus as, as three things. That first, he was humble. That that when when Satan came 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 after him, that he when he was attacking him, that he was humble. That he didn't say, "Oh, I can do that," because I'm I'm Jesus. He humbled himself. He 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 said, "No, I I don't need to throw myself off this building. No, I don't need to bow down to you, Satan." No, I don't need to turn, turn this, this stone into bread. He was humble. He was humble in his humanity. And number two, he was hungry. He was passionate about why he was doing it. And number three, he was holy. He was humble, he was hungry, and he was holy. He was set apart. He knew who he was. And we're going to look a little bit more about that as we intro multi-ethnic conversations next week. Let us pray. Lord, you are so good, so powerful, so wonderful, so mighty. And we give ourselves to you. When we struggle with our identity, may we lean on you and your word. When we struggle with making you a priority, may we lean on you and lean on your word and when we struggle with with who your authority is may we lean on you and your word lord we love you we praise you in your name amen